First, I'd like to start by uh, thanking Mauricio Santa Maria for this invitation and being with you and also my greetings to the Council of the Americas for organizing this event and all the people here participating and all the panelists, William Maloney, Chief Economist of the World Bank. I'd like to now quickly present some of my slides to give you the economic scenario, just like we have it from the government perspective, but also to end up with these three important challenges for the economic politics, policies. As far as the productive activity and the challenges that we're having with this international crisis, first of all, I must say that Colombia has had a very pronounced recovery in the second semester of last year and the first one of this year. And this has been possible thanks to our fiscal policies because Colombia had a fiscal and monetary policy that was very expansionary from last year. But now we have an inversion, especially in the monetary policy. So that creates uh, some questions regarding our future. This uh, recovery has been unequal uh, on the different sectors. Here we have some data of 2020, uh, compare also to the recovery in 2021 of 10.7%. So that was a positive trend in for some Latin American countries that have fared very well, Chile, Panama. In here, we have the two factors in fiscal uh, policies. We see the two yellow columns, the nominal growth of primary expenditure that was very pronounced in 2020, especially during the pandemic, but continue to be the same in 2021, 6.6%, .6%, which is in real growth that's very important. And just this year, we have the beginning of a moderation in public expenditure. How, nonetheless, we can see that the fiscal deficit is very pronounced. We see that the Bank of the Republic increased, increasing, increased the rates. But at the beginning of this year, as we know, the increase has been very pronounced. In, uh, and then we'll see the real rates. As far as economic recovery, the growth has been positive, very positive, especially at the beginning of the second semester of last year, the beginning of this year. We can see the performance of the economy, but now we have a negative inflection in May. Those are the latest figures that we have. On the right, we can see the figures per semesters, especially the yellow line, which is the growth vis-a-vis -vis the 2019 growth by quarters. We see that the last quarter, in the at the beginning of the first two quarters of last year, there was a negative growth because of unemployment. But then we have a very pronounced recovery of 11.3% growth. Of course, we're comparing these with figures of three years ago. So it has not been a spectacular growth, but most likely they're gonna tell this government that, they, that this government has uh, being uh, responsible for an acceleration of the economy. So it is positive, but it's not an extraordinary growth, nonetheless. However, we have some problems in certain sectors. As we see, there is a lot of inequality as far as uh, the growth of some productive sectors. We have arts, uh, uh, recreation, leisure, uh, followed by uh, communications, 
information and communications. They have uh, had a dynamic development uh, because of the pandemic. And on the negative side, we have other sectors that have not been able to recover, especially uh, mining and construction. In construction, in civil works and housing, we mainly have problems in civil works. There is a, they're, they're falling behind. The first item at risk is inflation, of course. Inflation, it's, it's an international phenomenon, and not just the strictly Colombian. It has generated an international uh, phenomenon, the interest rates. The board of the Bank of the Republic has uh, increased them as well, the interest rates. And I would say that the goal was to counteract inflation, but I would say that the most important has been to avoid the flow of capitals uh, outside. However, we see that the effect of, because of the effect of inflation, we're gonna have uh, uh, limited measures. There's, there's some demand as the Bank of the Republic uh, of, 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 for international prices, of course, uh, for this uh, phenomenon in Colombia that we call indexi indexation. So this has generated some inflationary inertia, but we've seen this also last year. Last year, we were in the midst of this process. It was a complex process. So that is an important challenge as far as in the inflation policy. As far as inflation goes, we can see that in, we had 10.2% inflation trend, but in foods was also 5%, so the highest figures in Latin America. And as far as the basic inflation, and thanks also to the Bank of the Republic, is 6.4, especially in the sector fuels. As far as real terms for we can see the 9% rate. The total inflation is still negative, but we have now 2.6% compared to the base, basic inflation. So I would say that we will see with the board to that the board will make decisions on interest rates. And we'll have to see what the consensus, consensus will be. So the, in, the increase in interest rates has had an impact on all uh, economic sectors. Both, we have had a, a strong increase both in deposits and credits. On the right, we can see the, the interest rates of government bonds, the TES bonds. Well, we've seen a very considerable increase, but you can see that in the end, this process has stabilized itself but not quite yet in the financial system, but there is a slight trend downwards of financing the government deficit. This is very different, for instance, when we have a, a test rate uh, over 4% when in compared to to what we have now, the fiscal rate of uh, 10%. As far as the international, international context, that's a second item, negative, but there's one positive trend for Colombia. First of all, the global economic growth has slowed down considerably. Also the international trade, we have the issue of the uh, commod price of commodities in the international trade that had, has an a positive and, and a negative element for Colombia. Positive is that our 
uh, product uh, of exportations have very high price. The other negative trend is the toughening of uh, international financial conditions, meaning that the access of emerging economies to private markets of capitals has been very difficult during this year. As far as the growth of uh, a global economic growth, last year, there was an estimated growth of 6.1%. So now we have a downward trend. You can see that this is a, a global trend with the only exception of a large country of India that has fared well. But in Latin America, it's one of the regions uh, that was one of the worst regions in the world. But now is not so serious. And the ECLAC also has uh, forecasted growth. ECLAC forecasted 2.7% growth. As far as commodities, we have on the left prices of energy and foods, food items with the spectacular growth, especially after the invasion of Russia on Ukraine, although it had already started uh, at the end of last year. You may observe that the food items and energy products has started to go down. So that's a positive element. I believe that now we, we got to the peak uh, the, globally and in Colombia. And we'll see that in practice. These um, downward trend is going to be very slow. In the case of the U.S., inflation is still very high for the historic standards of the U.S. So the debate right now is to see what is going to be decided and discussed. There's going to be an announcement by the president of the U.S. Federal Reserve. The positive trend has been the exchange terms, the red line in Colombia that has had a 25% improvement, much better, as you can see, compared to Mexico and Peru that have had a, a negative performance. The last element is the increase, the rise of um, risk primes and, and, and interest rates. As we can see now, the risk per country on the left of emerging countries compared to Latin America, it's a, a little bit higher in lighter blue, with worse than the average emerging uh, countries. We have in Colombia, that has had a very strong decline uh, as a result of losses of investment of last year. And on the right, we have the comparison of Colombia with other Latin American countries. We see that Colombia had some risks more comparable to Mexico last year. But then after loss of investments, we have gotten close to Brazil. So in a category of higher risk. However, you can see that during the last month, we've had a downward trend in uh, risk in Colombia. So we'll, we can see what's, we will see if this possibility will turn into a positive trend. Now, the determining factors are the interest rates. We can see that, the comparison in Latin America, the long-term US interest rates in lighter blue and the risk spreads. So the interest rates in the US are very important as a determining factor of the interest rates of emerging economies in Latin America. But you may observe here that during the last two months, the interest long-term U.S. interest rates has started to go down. Therefore, that has also brought down the Latin American bonds 
interest rates. This is very interesting because and important because even though you in US, there may be some expectations of an increase of interest rates in the short term. The long term ones will go down, as this chart shows you. And this creates the possibility for Colombia to go back to the market of emerging economies. But so far, the general trends have been very negative. You can see the flows of capitals of emerging economies uh, by JP Morgan. You see all these red columns. These are the hard currency bonds. You can see the collapse of March of last year in 2020. It was uh, astounding. But after that, in April, or actually mid-April of 2020, they turned positives. We had positive flows for the remainder of 2020 and 2021. But you can see at the end, in 2022, we have negative trends once again. The same thing happens with the yellow columns, these local bonds of emerging economies. In 2020, it was very negative, but it started being positive in the mid of 2020. In almost every month of 20. 21, but then it, they become again very negative. So the capital flows of emerging uh, economies, uh, as far as uh, cost and availability, have been very negative. In this context, Colombia has fared poorly, especially in monthly uh, purchases of test bonds from abroad. Yesterday, uh, Bloomberg announced the amount of bonds from Canada, companies in uh, Canada and Middle East and some European countries that have increased significantly, uh, uh, have increased the purchase of Colombian bonds. And on the right, we have a, a positive trend. One of the positive news from this uh, last uh, uh, week was the visit from the president from Spain if you take away the natural resources uh, in, from Spain, the main provider is Colombia. So uh, 1.5 uh, billion more in direct investment. So as far as investment, it's going very well. So if you, you I'll have the opportunity in New York, uh, mid-September to continue generating a positive image of Colombia to show the investment opportunities. So we have a very complex uh, economic situation and trend um, of this slowdown of the economy on the, during the second semester, especially uh, in 2023, but we still have very unequal uh, forecasts uh, in terms of semester. We'll go from 10.5 to 2.7 in the second semester. And on the right, we have the current uh, most recent projections from the Bank of Republic and the Ministry of Finance 1.1. It seems to me a little bit pessimistic. And then 2.2 is very similar that was published last month. So I would say there were between two and 3%. These are the uh, uh, provisions from 1993. I'll end up with the what the for the government were the challenges for the economic uh, uh, policies. I mean, I could include more, but there are three: the social sex area, where we have the uh, labor market, but also inequality and poverty that have gone up in the past year, especially even before the pandemic. So these are the reason of the social discontent uh, in Colombia. The second uh, that I, I didn't 
mentioned before, because to me it's very important, is the high commercial deficit that requires a pronounced diversification of exports. To, for me, this is the most important priority for the government. And third, public finances. And th this is what I need to grapple with. And it has to do with the proposed tax reform that has been subject of a large debate. And I'll refer to this at the end of my presentation. So socially, we can see that uh, we were able to have a recovery as far as unemployment. Uh, we had very high figures for unreported uh, jobs during the pandemic. And then as far as poverty, since 2019, even before the pandemic that we had. So that means that today we have 4.6 million more poor people compared to 2018. And we also have inequality that has gone up based on the recent data. This is the labor recent labor history, the collapse during the pandemic, the loss of 6 million jobs, but then the uh, recovery uh, in 2021, uh, the whole economy started a very pronounced recovery at the during the mid of last, in the middle of last year. So we could say now that we have been able to have a strong recovery. So, however, the unemployment rates are still high. In fact, 11% of unemployment, total unemployment rate is higher than the one that we had pre-pandemic on the other side, we see on the right, much higher unemployment rates. But compared to other Latin American countries, Colombia is among the worst in Latin America as far as unemployment. We're competing against Brazil and Peru, especially with Brazil, as far as one of the highest unemployment rates in Latin America. As far as poverty, we see the increase in poverty during the pandemic in 2021 is uh, improving a little bit in 2022 but we have the increase of poverty that already started in 2019 as i said 4.6 million more poor people compared to 2018 and if we compare it So it's one of the highest ones in Latin America, just like inequality. So this country requires a, a very strong social policy. We have a very high commercial deficit in uh, current accounts. Although all exports items are recovering as far as uh, commodities. However, we're just at the beginning of a long process of export diversification that needs to be a priority, not just for this government, but for the following ones. We can say that we're in a similar situation compared to the 60s when the country had to diversify itself and not only focused on coffee. Uh, and we took 15 years to achieve a successful diversification. Now we need to diversify as, much, as far as oil, and this should be a long-term diversification. And I believe that this is uh, related to uh, revert deindustrialization, what we call in economics a premature deindustrialization compared to developing countries. And it has to do with another problem, which is the very low investment in science and technology, as we will see in in a few minutes. We have here the current account deficit, 6% 6 of the GDP comparable to the ones that we had in 2014, 2015, when we had a, uh, when the oil prices plummeted. And this has been financed with uh, um, a direct investment, but 
we need corrections of this deficit. Perhaps this is the main engine of uh, economic uh, uh, growth in a country. Last year, all the exporting groups improved, compensating in many cases the decrease in the fall in the pandemic. On the right, we see the total exports for this year. The first semester was very positive, but if you compare it with the past, yeah, it looks positive compared to years of, uh, of crisis that started with the uh, oil fall, but comparable to the levels of exports that we had in 2011, 2013. As far as non-traditional exports, non-oil exports rather, we have a good recovery in 2021 and 2022. However, we have not achieved the uh, 2018 levels or even 2012 or 2013 levels. So we have a long uh, path ahead of us. During the past years, we've had a positive trend. I remember when I was part of the board of the uh, Bank of the Republic, uh, journalists asked me, what would be what should be the growth and i said 20 percent per year and i should say that that's the correct figure so we have two years growing at that level we need 15 more at least so that's the challenge not just for this government but all of the following governments the other area is this collapse of the participation of the manufacturing industry in the gdp so, as I stated, one of the goals is to reindustrialize Colombia. And, and you have seen the recent statements by the uh, president. And on the other hand, which is a national shame, is the very negligible investment in science and technology. We rank eight in this area. That's a national shame. So, how can we have much more R&D and to be connected uh, with the productive sector? That's what we need to do as far as exports and reindustrialization. Finally, public finances where the increase of uh, public expenditure in 2021 generated a deficit. Co which is substantial and also of public debt. So that's a huge challenge for this government. Added to that is a very specific issue, the um, fund of stabilization of fuel prices, because before there was the policy of not increase, not to increase fuel prices. In uh, and then we saw the rise of all oil prices in the world. So that's the biggest challenge in the fiscal area for the government. It's to complete the fiscal adjustment at the same time that we finance an additional level of social expenditure in order to meet the first priorities, which are the essential priorities of the government, the social policies. And that's the reason for the fiscal reform that we have proposed, presented to the Congress of the Republic. As far as the fiscal area, we can see that 2020, 2021, public expenditure was considerable. And there has been some adjustment of the fiscal balance of the government, but it's very insufficient. 5.6% of the GDP for uh, uh, servicing of the debt and this is compared to the fiscal agreement that we need to turn it into a positive perform a trend uh, for 2024 next year in 2024 so basically it's an adjustment of uh, two percent of the gdp that we need to accomplish so it's not an easy task but then we have this other problem the fund of stabilization of fuel prices. In any event, 
this 2.7%, we need to add it to the 5.6% from before, meaning that the challenge that we have ahead of us is of 8% in GDP in terms of fiscal deficit. Not only for the fiscal rules, this 27 that we need to pay next year. So that's part of the next year's budget. As far as debt, we get to 65% of the GDP has come down, uh, but it's still over 55% of the GDP, which is the goal uh, as fiscal rules associated with the uh, primary adjustment. Just uh, for historical terms, when I was a minister before, public debt was 15% of the GDP. So meaning a fourth, but uh, dif this different times. That was the public debt that I left behind me. The problem from the fiscal point of view, uh, we can see this chart and the one before it are from the e OECD. We have a fiscal structure that's very unusual where personal income generate very little tax, 18% of the GDP against 51% of the OECD. And we have a lot of social tax, much higher than the OECD and the VAT. We have a fiscal structure completely at atypical. So that's why one of the reasons, as you can see in this chart, is that in the areas of higher income, we have two items of income, the ones on top, which are dividends and occasional gains that represent half of income of those very high income households. So you cannot do a fiscal progressive fiscal reform that does not affect, have an impact on occasional gains. I know that this is rather controversial, but in the discussions that we had with the Congress and with many uh, business sectors, we're debating how we can do that. So with the Congress and all the different sectors, we'll be discussing this issue. These are the main elements of the reform that we have proposed based on the constitutional principles that we have on equity, progressive, progressiveness, and efficiency. This was just to simplify, to say all income are the same, no matter the source. But that seems that as far as dividends and occasional gains is not so. However, the main elephant elements of the reform are the uh, reduction of uh, tax of uh, low income people, low income households, So we're trying to focus on high income households in order to have an equitable distribution of wealth. So natural persons, there is a proposal. You know that in this century, we've had taxes on uh, companies or legal entities different from natural individuals. Second, limit business of tax benefits for some sectors, but on the other hand, perhaps the, it's, it's a matter of how to improve the contributions in order to export. So in order to fulfill that first goal, which is to diversify our exports. Then we have to improve contributions of the sector of natural resources to the financing of the public sector, basically, because this is a sector 
where we have, we're trying to just capture uh, the wolf of tax, a tax on the exceeding profits of the sector through a tax on exports beyond a certain basic price. And then we have to uh, mitigating uh, environment and health uh, uh, areas uh, also to improve uh, when it comes to carbon, the carbon situation, any health. We've had some degree of controversy and also dividends and occasional gains have been the two issues where we had a lot of controversies and the many measures to fight evasion of uh, tax evasion measures one is precisely trying to gains by companies that provide digital services from abroad this is a very important issue currently so so beyond a certain levels of clients and sales, those people that do not, do not have residency to in the country to charge them a rate. For instance, there's another measure to, stop, to establish that the companies cannot replace their fiscal presence for fiscal reasons. And they go to uh, paradise uh, tax uh, shelters because that would be a tax evasion, clearly. And the third is that for executives, basically, uh, all, uh, all natural uh, individuals have to pay taxes. I mean, there are some people that are not included. I know that some people get irritated by this. I mean, all of this, uh, it's upsetting, of course. It's uncomfortable. But we've been very open to debate. We have had alternative proposals. Some people may not like some of these measures. And they may tell us uh, what can produce more income. Focus on the positive, not the negative. So we would say that we will be able to achieve 25 thousand millions of pesos so perhaps we can even generate twice as much and that's associated by a ref to a reform with an expansion but we know that we need to have a, a much more amicable system with people because there have been many complaints based on the inefficiency and the pressure on businesses. That was the first sector that complained. Uh, for instance, the exporters and our, you know, they say that if the, our priorities are exports, how can we not um, have a good relationship? So. This is our estimate of how much we're thinking of collecting for natural individuals and then followed by uh, oil and carbon. We have a small tax on gold, which we, we, will, we will eliminate, avoiding uh, gold smuggling, which is very easy to smuggle, and then legal entities, and then what I mentioned, about free trade areas and then other taxes. Thank you very much.